Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you this morning. Good to be back. Good to be here. So many of you I know personally. <clears throat> Carol and I were here in 2016 and 17. 20, boy, it's a long time ago. Boy, you've aged. Uh, <clears throat> Carol um, got COVID and pneumonia over the Thanksgiving weekend in 2020. Uh, she went into the hospital uh, that Sunday after Thanksgiving, <clears throat> was in the hospital for three weeks, uh, and <clears throat> no one was allowed to visit with her. That's horrible, absolutely terrible. However, I called the chaplain. It was a Catholic hospital. I called the chaplain. I said, I'm a pastor. Can you get me in to see my wife? And so all things worked together good. So I went in, and those of you who know Carol in a more personal way, I walked into the room, and she's very lucid. She looks up to me, and she said, John, you've got to get me out of here. So we did and brought her home uh, for four days on hospice care, and she passed away about 4.30 in the afternoon on the 30th of December, 2020. Uh, Pam Garber, who is with me, her, her married name, Pam Garber, but now Pam Billow, uh, lost her husband in 2019 due to liver failure, and um, it was due to um, a medicine he was taking for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and <clears throat> they had to check the liver function all the time, about every six weeks, and it showed no, no abnormalities. However, uh, the liver was failing and they didn't know it. So she lost her husband in 2019 and the four of us were friends because Pam and her family attended attend Jefferson. They were part of Jefferson. They came out of the Bristol United Methodist Church and went to Jefferson when the pastor from that church went to Jefferson as pastor. And so we we're good friends, and uh, we would see each other from time to time as we traveled about, have dinner together. So anyway, the long, long story short, uh, Pam uh, is a, re a registered hospice nurse. Uh, she retired early, and uh, Mary Terry Garber, who is a full-time mechanic, diesel mechanic, and also a farmer, and owned a farm of 100 and, or 200 acres, which we now live on, and uh, she left her career to uh, marry him and help him raise his five children and one that she had. Uh, and that was in 1985. Uh, and so uh, Terry had lost two of his wives due to cancer. And from those two wives, there were five children that were uh, brought into that family. So uh, that's some of the, our background and our history. So Pam and I married uh, it'll be a year this, this coming October. And uh, I sold my townhome to my son, Troy, who is a pastor, uh, there in Lockport, Illinois. And so then <clears throat> I said to Pam, I said, look, it's going to be easier for me to move this way because uh, you have grandchildren and children that are close by, uh, closer than if she moved towards Chicago. And so that's how that all happened. So I I came and moved on to a farm. I, uh, fortunately, I do not have to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning and milk cows. I'm so happy about that. But I do have my chores. I have farm chores. I have never had farm chores before. One of them, which is to keep the bird feeder filled. I mean, that's laborious. And uh, a few other things. We have three and a half uh, acres of grass to cut. Uh, and fortunately, we have a a zero term more to do that in and uh, so we have a great time on the farm and so we're here today as your guest and we're so happy to be here it's so good to see you um, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to our time in this community uh, I moved here uh, right after we got married on the 9th of October and so we'll be here just about a year in October so we're, we're glad that we can be here and it's good to see all of you again um, I'm, I'm going to read a passage that's going to be on the screen for you, but, uh, you know, there's a certain spontaneity in the spirit, right? And uh, we, I like that. So uh, I'm going to ask you to stand, 
And if you want to follow along in, our, in your Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> beginning with verse 1, I'm going to read five verses. And this, this passage is going to be significant to the, to the message, as you'll see a little later. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urge you, he's talking to Timothy, as I urge you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. The church has always historically and even today dealt with false doctrine and continues to do so. Do so. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Amen. We're done with that. Now, <clears throat> uh, when, when do we finish here? Did I hear 1115? Thank you very much. You, you may be seated. Well, this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to take you to, <clears throat> to Ephesus. The year is about 50 A.D., a um, long, long time ago. Paul has uh, left Timothy at Ephesus. He is going to pastor the church there. But <clears throat> you think some of our cities in this country are a nightmare. Wait till you hear about Ephesus. <clears throat> when Paul gets there, their evangelistic team, they had an evangelism team that went. There are a number of people who followed Paul in evangelism, and they go into a city to start a church. Church planters, they're church planters. So when he gets there, he, he, he encounters, as soon as he walks into the city, 12 men who come up to him and said, um, <clears throat> Paul said, well, whose baptism have you had? And, and they said, well, John the Baptist's baptism. You remember John the Baptist went around uh, baptizing Jews in repentance, preparing for their coming of the Messiah. And so these, these 12 men have, have followed John's baptism, but they have not heard uh, that there is a Holy Spirit. And uh, he, they... He, Paul said, well, did you believe when, when you received the Holy Spirit? We, we've never knew there was a Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit had come. So what Paul does is he lays his hands on them. They pray. They, they hear the message of Christ. They believe in Christ. And they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because John the Baptist said, I baptize you in repentance, but there's one who's coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the baptizer. And so they, they are baptized uh, with the Holy Spirit there. And uh, uh, Paul has given them the message. And they receive Christ as their Savior. And one of the demonstrations of the Spirit at that moment and in that time was speaking in tongues, which they did. Well, he keeps going on, and he goes into the synagogue. Well, <clears throat> what's interesting here about the synagogue is the synagogue becomes the center of evangelism very important concept here. They didn't go to the street corner and begin preaching. They go into the synagogue because they're reasoning with the Jews and what they're sharing with the Jews is your Messiah has come. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The synagogue becomes the center of evangelism. Now with your new pastor coming, may I suggest to you this morning because we're going to talk about his coming to you. I've never met him but I know of his reputation. Pam had him as a youngster in a trekker program at Jefferson. So the synagogue becomes a center of evangelism and your church in this city can become a center of evangelism. If any evangelism is gonna occur, any people are going to come to Christ as Savior and your church is gonna grow with new believers, it will be right here. It's not gonna be down the corner it's not going to be in a new evidence edifice that you go out by the toll road and build. It's going to be right here. Not only does this become the center of evangelism, but your, your store becomes a center of evangelism as well. There are people who are 
non-believers who walk into that store every Saturday because they're looking for a bargain. They become people who could be one to Christ, or at least witness to in Christ. We don't save anybody. We don't convert anybody. That's the work of ministry of the Holy Spirit. What are we? We're simply messengers. We're messengers to give out the message of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Why? Because people are lost. They're non-believers. They need Christ as Savior. So your church is going to be, is a center of evangelism. Any evangelism is going to occur among this congregation and among the leaders of this congregation and with your pastor is going to occur right here in this place. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit will draw people here to hear the message of the gospel. That's why it's important that we preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit will draw people to the store and the Holy Spirit will draw people to this church to hear the message of the gospel because God's not willing that any should perish. He wants people to be saved. Uh, Al and Desi are here, and I know Al's story. We've talked a number of times about it. The Holy Spirit, that day, drew you to that church to hear that message of the gospel by that Pentecostal preacher. Remember that? Sure you do. And when the invitation was given, you walked down the aisle and received Christ as your Savior, did you not? Praise God. They're here because of that. There are a lot of people like Al and Desi all over this city, all over this place. So the, sen the synagogue becomes a center of evangelism. Any evangelism is going to occur, I'm repeating myself, but it's for emphasis, is going to occur right here. And God will draw people. Now, the Spirit of God may impress upon you to invite somebody to come and be a part of this. Okay, then that's your responsibility, my responsibility. So the other thing that happens in, in, in uh, Ephesus, they get a lot of resistance from the people in the synagogue. And so Paul says, well, you know, there's, there's more than one way to skin this cat. So they go next door to the hall of Tyrrhenius. Tyrrhenius has opened his lecture hall for them, and they begin preaching in the lecture hall. So important that we're preaching not just to, to encourage and strengthen you, but we're preaching to share the gospel so that if there's somebody in the congregation who does not know Jesus Christ and they find that God loves them and cares for them and sent his son to die on the cross for them, that they will come to find Christ and receive Christ as their Savior. And you will be amazed who God will draw here. Our role is to open arms of love and acceptance. Alarms of love and acceptance. We have to break away from our cliques and we have to infiltrate the folks that come who need Jesus. That is, infiltrate whereby we saddle up next to them, put our arm around them and say, so glad you're here. My name is John, your name is Ed, and we're so happy to have you. By the way, uh, do you have plans for lunch today? Uh, no? Well, I'd like to invite you to join me and my wife for lunch today. Would you do that, please? Well, we have three children. Sorry, bring the, ch bring the children with you. That's evangelism. That's infiltrating and, and saddling up to folks and encouraging them and strengthening them because they need Christ. Do you remember the day you needed Christ? Do you remember the day of your salvation? Do you remember the trauma and the the heartache and the difficulty that you went through in your life, in your personal life. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home. But maybe you're like Al and you ran with the wrong crowd. And God reached down and snatched you out of that crowd. So he, he encounters um, the lecture hall. Miracles are happening. God always authenticates his message by doing the miraculous. The greatest miracle <laughs> that could ever happen here is somebody who receives Christ and their life is radically changed. It's the greatest miracle. The transformation of the heart of a person, of a life of a person that sets them on a different course. Great miracle. God wants to do miracles here. And he uses the gospel 
to bring that about. Well, there's always opposition. Always opposition. And, uh, but the miracles were, were just sweeping across Ephesus. I mean, the, the, the Ephesus had the third largest library in, in, the, in the world. 12,000 scrolls were cataloged and put in a library. They had a theater, an outdoor theater, that seated 25,000 people. And it was a huge city. But it was a wicked city. There was occult practices. There was witchcraft. They were selling indulgences. They had a temple to the goddess Artemis. And if you, if you could see the statue of Artemis, you can go on the Internet and see it. You see, it, it is grotesque because it's filled with breasts all over its whole body. This goddess Artemis was worshipped by the population. There was businesses that were connected to the worship of Artemis and connected to the temple. They come in and preach the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that we worship the true and living God. Guess what kind of opposition you're going to get to that? And there's a riot that occurs in the city and is finally put down. The believers there had a very difficult time. It's tough preaching the gospel, and it's tough leading people to Christ because there's going to be opposition. There's going to be those who will come against it. There will be the enemy who will come against it. There will be an enemy that will come against your young pastor. There will be an enemy that will come against your leadership. There will be an enemy that will come against you. However, if you just sit back and you want to be comfortable for the rest of your life, until they carry your casket down this aisle, fine. We can be comfortable. Not much opposition there. Not much conflict there. We'll just be comfortable. And we'll continue to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. And then we'll get down to 20 people, 10 people. And those 10 people can't afford to keep the place going. And then you appeal to the city to buy the place. Now, I hate to put that on you that way, but I want, I want some shock here. I want us to see that you have a new day coming, and that day is going to start September the 4th. A new day coming. You've got a young, enthusiastic, I heard him preach. I went online, heard him preach. Powerful young man wants to come and lead people to Christ, build up this body of Christ. Let the Spirit of God draw people here. So there's a riot. Demetrius, the silversmith, stirs things up. I mean, it is a nightmare in Ephesus for the church, this young church. Nightmare for them. So he says, Timothy, you stay in Ephesus. So what are... Timothy's expectations. Well, let's turn to 2 Timothy, if you will, chapter 4. These are Paul's expectations of Timothy. Paul's expectations. Timothy, this is what I want you to do in Ephesus. And for those of you who are in positions of leadership and influence, this is vitally important that you understand what a young man is to do here. He said, in the presence of God, writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead, he's giving the authority of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Just follow that first verse. Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing, second coming, and his kingdom. So you have the second coming of Christ in Revelation chapter 19, you have the kingdom beginning, the literal reign of Christ upon this earth for a thousand years, beginning in chapter 20. Paul is following that progression. The kingdom, I give you this charge, Timothy. 
Timothy, this is what I expect from you. I have mentored you. I have trained you. I have worked with you. I have prayed for you. I have led you. I have infused my life into your life. Now, Timothy, it's time to go to work, and this is what I expect. Okay? Let's look at it. I give you this charge. Preach the word. Well, the Greek word there is logos. And uh, if you go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the logos, the logos was with God, and the logos is God. Same word. But there the translators capitalize the word, word, because it's referring to the deity of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, Christ with God, and the word is God. It's the deity of Jesus Christ. The attacks that come against Christian doctrine is the attack against who Jesus Christ is. He is God in human flesh who has come to die on a cross to save us from our sin and death. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free, follow, from the law of sin and death. Our two greatest enemies is sinfulness and death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 and 6.23. Sin and death. People are blinded in their sinfulness, and when we preach the, God, the word, because the, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates. When they hear the gospel, it opens their, their mind and their heart up so that the blindness begins to fade and they begin to see Jesus Christ and they repent of their sin, they ask Christ to be their Savior, and they are born again. That's what this church is about, or at least should be about. Bringing people to Christ. The hardest people to win to Christ are your family members and your extended family members. Some of them are lost. Some of you have grandchildren who are lost. They left the church a long time ago, never to return. You have grandchildren who are lost. You may have children who are lost. I have a son in part of my family who confessed to me two weeks ago that he's never been a believer and does not plan to become one. In Jesus Christ. We've witnessed to him. We've shared the gospel with him. That boy has heard the gospel more times than you can imagine. Confess to me, because I came right out and asked him. Share the gospel with him. I just wrote him a letter sharing with him the gospel. Sometimes a son or a daughter can be so far away that you never think they'll ever come back, they'll never be rescued. But you know what you can do? You can call them. You can send a letter to them. He says, Paul said to Timothy, preach the gospel, preach the word, the Logos. Preach Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Even though the word is not caps here, you know the context. The context determines that. The context in John is the deity of Christ. The context here is preach the word. Preach Christ as Savior. And they said, be prepared in season and out of season. I wondered about that. What would be out of season? Preach the word when it's not convenient. When it's not convenient. You know in the first century when it wasn't convenient? I'll tell you when it wasn't convenient. It wasn't convenient to go into Ephesus and preach the gospel when the, the city and its population were so blinded and so immersed in this goddess Artemis that they went to the temple to worship and there were all kinds of, of weird and evil things that went on in association with that temple. The ruins are still there to this day. Be prepared in season. Another time in the first century when it was inconvenient was when the emperor, when the Roman Senate declared that the emperor is God. 
He is to be worshipped. And so if you're a Christian, you're a believer, and you're preaching the gospel that the true and living God is, is God Almighty, Jehovah, and in his son Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're in violation of the law. You're in violation of the law of the Senate in the Roman Empire. You're subject to arrest. You're subject to torture. You're subject to imprisonment. Preach it when it's not convenient. Can you imagine for a moment that your pastor could be handcuffed and taken away to jail for preaching the scripture, all of the scripture? And you said, oh no, pastor, that will never happen in the land of the home of the brave and the free. Now just think for a moment. Can you go back in time and ever imagine or think that Congress of the United States and the Supreme Court would redefine what marriage is? And what constitutes a man and a woman? Did you ever in your lifetime think that would ever occur? Preach the gospel, Timothy, when it's inconvenient. Nero comes to power in 54. He is a monster. He is an absolute monster. He slaughters Christians by the hundreds and thousands because they refuse to worship the emperor. So he said to Timothy, look, folks, we're, we're in a fight for our lives here. So he says to Timothy, preach it when it's inconvenient. He goes on. He said, um, correct, correct false doctrine. Correct false doctrine. You have to be careful who you allow to teach your children and your youth and your adults. False doctrine can creep in. And in the New Testament church, there, you know, the apostles are always fighting this false doctrine that came in. Oh, first century false doctrine. Ha ha. You're not really a good Christian unless you keep the law. You've got to keep the law. Do you know there are groups today? I have some friends who have children who are part of these groups. These, they're almost cultic. They, they, they dress in Old Testament garb. They keep the rituals of Judaism, of Old Testament. They keep the law. And they're born, they're born again, professing believers in Christ and saying, your salvation is not complete unless you keep the law of Moses. And you, you abide by the re- rules, the, the dietary rules and religious rules and regulations of the law under Moses. And they meet, they're having, they're having a huge assembly where thousands will show up in, in, a, in an assembly hall in this country. It's either happening now or it's going to happen in just the near future. False doctrine. Paul writes Galatians against that. Our false doctrine, somebody comes in and says, I want to join your church, I want to be part of your church, but I want to tell you something, you're not really a complete Christian until you speak in tongues. It's false doctrine. There's a gift of teaching. There's a gift of helps. There's a gift of giving. There's, there's various gift of evangelism. And there is a gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Does everybody have the gift of teaching? Does everybody have the gift of helps? Does everybody have the gift of giving? No, of course not. Just doesn't make sense, does it? That you take one gift and say everybody has to be there. So he, he goes on, 
and he says, um, correct false doctrine, rebuke bad behavior, bad behavior, sat with a gentleman one time who had lunch together. Remember the church, leader in the church? And I said to him, uh, the word on the street is you have a girlfriend and you're married, but not to her. You know what he said to me? <clears throat> That's none of your business. I said, oh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. I passed to the church. Sometimes you have to, pastor has to correct bad behavior. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Because a time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. Folks, we're in that time. Franklin Graham just uh, completed uh, a series of crusades in, in England and in London. Chris Morgan, who is a broadcaster, a British broadcaster, you may remember him. He was one of the judges on America Got, America's Got Talent interviewed Franklin Graham, and he said this, and I quote, he said, uh, Mr. Graham, times are changing, people are changing. Uh, don't you think you should change your stance on important social and biblical issues? It's interesting that he included that. You know, um, We've moved on, he writes, Morgan says, we've moved on much from large swaths of the Bible. Oh my, this is insidious. Large swaths of the Bible. Oh, you mean like Leviticus 18? You mean like Romans chapter 1? Large swaths of the Bible? And then he quote, he, he stops a quote, unquote. Franklin Graham looked him in the eye. And he said this, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. People will not endure sound doctrine. Teach them. Be careful that the word of God is preached faithfully, purely. Then he closes with Timothy. He says, but you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Keep your head, Timothy. You know why? Because everything starts in the head. Lies start in the head. Sex starts in the head. Everything starts in the head. Everything. Keep your head. Interesting comment he makes. Keep your head, Timothy. In all situations, endure hardship. It's going to be tough here. Do the work of an evangelist. Preach the gospel. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Heard yesterday at the store and the, the huge amount of funds that were taken, and I know that those funds go for missions. Um, and Doris had an opportunity to pray with a woman who is distraught and share Christ with her. Evangelism. That store is a center, can be a center of evangelism. This church can be a center of evangelism because when the, the apostles went into a new town to start a church, they always went to the synagogue. In most cases, on a rare occasion, they would go to the river where people gathered for prayer or whatever. But they go to the synagogue because that's where people who were at least somewhat interested and they would, they would argue for Christ as Savior and Lord.
Eric Metaxas has written a beautiful biography on the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer probably has written the, the greatest book on discipleship that's ever been published. And in this book, Metaxas talks about Bonhoeffer and how he opposed the Nazis. Always preached the gospel. And he sided with the Stauffenberg group who planned to assassinate Hitler when they placed the bomb in the satchel underneath the table where Hitler was meeting with his general. Hitler survived that, as you know. But Bonhoeffer was arrested, and he was taken to Flossenburg, where there was a POW camp. You know what he did? This is a great story, true story. Bonhoeffer would preach the gospel to the guards in German as they would pass by. From his barracks, he'd open a window and preach out through the screens or through the window, the open window, preach the gospel to these guards. God loves you. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and he arose again. The simple gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And he preached the gospel, preached the gospel. And just a few weeks before the Allies liberated that camp, the guards came one morning. They yanked Bonhoeffer out of the barracks. They stripped off all of his clothing. And they hung him naked in front of everybody. He gave his life for the gospel. What can you do? What are the expectations for this congregation? I'll give you three of them. The th these three God will bless. You can be assured God will bless these three. We know what the expectations are for a young pastor, as we know about Timothy and Paul the Apostle. First one is prayer. I would encourage you to form prayer circles, three to five people. You're not to pray for the medical needs of people, as important as that is. You're not to pray for the missionaries. You're to pray for the life of this church. Pray for the life of this church and for its people. Pray for the spiritual needs of this congregation. Pray that God would open avenues of evangelism. Pray that God would bless the pastor and give him a heart for evangelism, that he would preach the gospel. Pray that people God would draw people here. But when they come, they'll be strangers. But friends, when they leave, let them be your friend. Let them be your friend, your new friend. Don't let them leave as a stranger. We have to be careful that we, so, we don't so cluster together in our own times of fellowship, which are important and are crucial to our life and the life of the body, but let us branch out from our, from our groups and let us make new people our friends. Let them be your friend, but pray for the life of this body. And God will bless that. He will bless it. Second, give attention to the public and private reading of Scripture. We have raised two generations I believe it's two generations. We have raised in the church and within our Christian families, we have raised two generations of illiterate Christians who do not know the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the reason is, I'll tell you the reason. It came to me this week. We've allowed media to rob us from reading. We've allowed media to rob us, to take away our, our, to take away our freedom and our individuality as believers in Christ, to put aside the media, including the phone, and sit down and just consume and meditate on the scriptures. God will bless that. He blesses my heart and soul every day 
in reading Scripture. Well, Pastor, we expect that of you. Yes, but God expects it of all believers. The public and private reading of the Scriptures on a tablet, on a phone. I love reading uh, Scriptures on my phone. But I have to control my media experience. I have to control it. Either you control it or it will control you. It will control you. God blesses prayer and God blesses the reading, public reading of the scriptures. And then God blesses your personal witness in Christ. When my family comes together, which is not that often, several times a year, it's several times a year you get them together. For those of you who have family that live in this area and they're only a couple of minutes away by a car, God bless you. You have no idea how fortunate you are. But if you have children like mine that live all over the country, getting them together is very unusual and rare, at least once a year, maybe twice if you're fortunate. But I gather the family together and pull them together into a circle. We will not let them eat until they gather together in a circle. Carol and I began to practice it. Now Pam and I practice it. We gather them together. We gather her family together. We gather my family together in a circle. And we offer a testimony of our faith in Jesus Christ. And some of those in the family are not believers. They're not believers. They're not born-again believers. Yeah, but Pastor, they've been there. They grew up in the church. We, we began taking our four children to church when they were a month old. Jeff, you and Emily have done the same. Bring those kids to church. They've, been in there. they've heard the gospel so many times. It's sickening. But you gather the family together and you hold hands and you share the message of your faith in Jesus Christ and then you pray in Christ. You thank God for the food. Thank that we can be together. It is a witness to them. And the one son who does, who's confessed to me that he's not a believer, he tries to get out of it. He'll stay outside where they're cooking. So he doesn't have to gather together in, in the circle of prayer. We call him in. His sister calls him in. Get in here now. As only she can do. The personal witness of Christ in the store, to a stranger, to your children, to your grandchildren. Bear a witness. I will bear a witness to my son till the day I die. I'll do it by letter. I'll do it by phone. I stopped and had breakfast with him, and dad always pays for breakfast, always pays for the meal. Kids making tons of money. He ever offered to buy my breakfast? Not once. Bear a witness to him. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you. Do you believe in Christ? I came around and asked him. No, I do not. And right now he has no interest. I pray God will open his heart. Prayer, God blesses prayer, folks. God blesses the reading of scripture in your own heart and your own mind each day as you Take time, shut down the media, and read. And then God blesses your own personal witness in Christ. He blesses those three things. If you will do that, and your pastor is faithful to the gospel, you know what will happen? I'll tell you exactly what will happen, because I've seen it happen. In that door, you'll see new people walk in here. They'll be hurting They'll be hungry for the word. They'll be discombobulated because they've got all kinds of issues going on in their life. They'll walk in that door. They'll come a stranger. But you make sure they leave as a friend. And then share the gospel with them. We can't convert anybody. We can't save anybody. You know who does that? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come down upon them like he did there in Ephesus. People took their scrolls, their occultic, witchcraft, nasty scrolls, and they put them in a pile. Do you have any idea what that was worth? 
It was worth 50,000 drachma. A drachma was a silver coin that was a day's wages in the first century. Do you have any idea what that would be worth today? They've calculated that it would be in the millions of dollars. They piled those scrolls up, and they came and they set them on fire and burned it. When my son became a Christian and got saved, he took his thousands of thousands of dollars of records. He went up into the mountains outside Tucson, Arizona, and it took him all day to burn it. It burned all day long. He said, I cannot have this in my life anymore. And he burned it. And it burned, took him all day. And he sat there in the hot sun and threw one record after another into it, one album after another of, of demonic, devilish type of music that was on those records. And that's what these folks did in Ephesus. They brought their scrolls. Demonic kind of things that were going on in that town that go on in Goshen. There's like a shooting in this town almost every day. In places you would never expect it, like Kircher Road. And they burned them. Burned them. Gone. But they were saved. That's the new church. God will draw people. He'll draw people by his spirit. Why? Because he wants, God's not willing that any should perish. He wants them to hear the gospel. Make sure you share the gospel. Share Jesus with them. And encourage your pastor to do that. And uh, I know there will be those who say, well, it's like preaching to the choir. You never know who's out there. Are you saved? Do you believe in Christ here? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Is today the day of salvation for you? God loves you, cares for you. He gave his heart and his life for you to save you from sin and death. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. I invite you to receive him as your Savior. Let's pray. Thank you, folks, for your patience today. This has just been on my heart for weeks. Dear Lord, I pray for a brother or a sister here who does not know the Lord that they could become a true brother and a true sister in Christ. May they receive you as our Savior. May we confess our sins, repent of our sins, and ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. I'm supposed to stall. I'm not very good at that. That's terrible stalling. Sorry. <laughs> very good. I have a feeling that John Billow was here in 2017 and preached a message very similar to that for us. We were in a, a different season then. And we're going to be in a different season soon. But the message is the same. People are, are going to be here. And it's our opportunity and our privilege we look at it that way, as our privilege to be a part of their community, to draw them in and say, you're friends and your family now. Doesn't happen from these pews, though, guys. I'm very afraid that in our next season, if we are just glued to these pews, we don't, are going to lose out on that privilege. Worse yet, if we are not here at all, we're going to lose out on that privilege but God has called us to be a part of that. And I'm excited about it, and I hope that you are excited too. We have a faithful God who has made promises to us, and he's never going to let us down. We just have to be here and be willing to put in the work to it. Amen. Can we do that? Let's stand and sing.
Him surrender.